voila. And also kind of my goal is to highlight your awesomeness as much as possible. I might share some of my background to give you context for why in the world I'm asking you a question or whatnot. But okay. my main focus for the final product is your audio telling your awesome story is basically it. The okay. conceit of the whole project is that for real, I've been a professional entertainer and mentalist for decade and a half, and I basically make it look like I can read minds for a living. That's I that's what it. I do. I and then it. afterwards, one of the main questions I got was, did you go to college for this stuff? And after long enough, I went, you know what? That would be hilarious if I just started a mind reader university to teach people how to think about imagination and opportunity and psychology of awesomeness. Let's let's do it. And then I thought, well, that would be a perfect idea for a podcast. So that's why the the gist of the show is mind reader university has guest professors who stop by to share their ideas. And then the tagline is picking the brains of the world's biggest thinkers. That's that's pretty much it. it. I love it. So and yeah. little known fact, I used to be a magician. That's outstanding. Like, How did you get into that? Amateur sense ever. Um, I started doing just little things with my kids, you know, like rope tricks and ball tricks and card tricks, coins, stuff like that. And, um, and then we started going to magic shops. We've got this great magic shop here in Little Rock. I lived in DC for a while, Al's Magic there, you know, just started kind of hanging out with cool people who did magic stuff. I was never great at it, but I had a lot of fun. And I did a lot of like my kids' Christmas class parties in elementary school where I would do some silly patter and a couple of tricks. That um, and makes they would me get so involved. happy. So they thought I was awesome. I was kind of ridiculous, but you know, whatever. <laughs> That's the name of the game, right? Be, be willing to be ridiculous and suddenly awesome yes. things happen. Yeah. Stop taking yourself so seriously. You know, it changes everything. That's fantastic. I can also hula hoop with fire and I can juggle a little bit. So, you know, a circus, a magic show. I don't know. There's something in my past. There was some, <laughs> there you go. That, that was the first one I got. My my uncle said, "All right, you're 21. We're going to get you a tattoo." I was like, "Really? Oh, no, okay." No, no, no tattoos. Mm. I'm. I couldn't stick with one. If um, the only kind of tattoo I would get is the kind that like they last a few months and they dissolve and then you get a new one, mm -hmm. I could do that. Yeah, yeah, I I could appreciate that for sure. Yeah. So uh, let's see, broad strokes. Um, my my approach is kind of strategic ignorance okay. which is i know enough to know you're awesome and that that i think you'd be a great fit other than that i try to stay pretty uninformed so that i can ask you the dumb questions that i would ask if i were just listening to the conversation love it so You'll get normal questions that I'm sure you fielded a thousand times and some hopefully we'll we'll see where it goes. Um, so yeah, other than that, I've got the next hour and a half ish open. Okay. If you've got to go before that, totally cool. Pull the plug whenever. I don't have uh, a specific just... time. If the dog starts to bark, he's locked in an upstairs room that will, you know. Got but it, I have a child locked in there with him. So. <laughs> <laughs> got it. All right. So Together they to, should be fine. Nice. Keep each other entertained. That, that's a good way to do it. So to, to kick off, how about you introduce yourself? That way you nail it. And we'll just go from there. Hi, my name is Kara Brookins. I am a speaker, an author, a single mother of four. And every now and then I build a house. I love your story. It is fascinating and I'm really stoked to be able to dig into it. So I want to talk about the things that you did and also how you made the transition to becoming a full-time speaker talking about the thing that you did. There's a lot of people who go, oh, I, I'd love to share my story. Never quite crack that nut of 
how in the world do you now present that in a valuable way to multi-million dollar companies that are internationally based in, in doing business all over the world? So that would be kind of cool to dig into. So what what is it about building a house that you do every once in a while? Was that a hobby? You ordered one from JC Penney in the <laughs> 50s and they mailed it to you. What what were you doing? Oh, I wish it could have just been like mail order house. That would have been really nice. No, I was a single mom and had been through a really, really tough situation, some domestic violence, um, had a stalker for a decade. And the kids and I were in a bad financial situation, a bad emotional situation, and we really needed a house. I was a computer programmer, so I was kind of a figure it out kind of person. And uh, I decided the way we would get that house was to build one. This was 2007, YouTube was brand new. So the idea merged of we need a house, we're gonna build a house, and there is now for the first time ever video tutorials of how to do everything on the internet. So it's a that, YouTube house. Wow, that is the perfect confluence of available technology, ease of use, just kind of that, that right time in human history to be able to have, have the ability to make that work the biggest piece of that puzzle i would imagine would be the gumption you had to just go yeah this is a thing i'm going to do you know well it, it was almost the right time first there were no smartphones yet this was like blackberry before we really had the internet or cameras on our phones so it would have been the perfect time now that we have, you know, full cell phone technology. We were walk watching YouTube back at the house on a big family shared computer in the den and then trying to remember those videos on the construction site. So we were like almost there with technology. We were bleeding edge, not cutting edge on technology. Um, but yeah, um, you know, someone said to me once, uh, ignorance can take the place of courage. And that's what happened with the gumption on building this house. We really didn't know what we were getting into. We had the idea of, you know, it, it can't be that hard. We've watched a few videos. They went together really fast. The building the house isn't going to be the hard part. We were actually, when we started, really focused on like, well, what color are we going to paint the walls? And what will the curtains look like? And those were our biggest concerns when we first started drawing the, the house plan. So it really wasn't until we got started that we are like, holy crap, what were we thinking? My kids were 17, 15, 11, and two. So, you know, I had a couple of couple of teenagers and a toddler out here. And uh, yeah, we just had no idea how brutally hard it is to build a house. That, that seems to have echoes across all sorts of organizations because departments will bring in a designer to make this color pretty make this a, a nice color, you know, something that'll make people click. And they've completely ignored the design part of architecting the whole strategy and then bring in the architects after it's already been built janky. So when, when you are drawing the plans and you're actually going, okay, it's on paper, we now need to do something on the dirt over here what was that process like when you start realizing from paper to four dimensional space is a world of difference? You know, it, it, even if we would have just bought the house plans, right? Because they sell house plans, you know, on the internet, but we were trying to save money every possible way we could. So we drew those house plans ourselves. Um, that was my 15 year old son and, and myself at the kitchen table with pencils and erasers on these big sheets of paper. Um, and I got a construction loan by taking those sheets of paper to the bank that we had drawn with pencil and some somehow convinced them to give me money based on those papers. And because we drew them ourselves, we didn't even have like the, the three-dimensional view that you get from an architect where they'll draw out what the front of the house looks like, the side view, the roof, the, you know, the electric, they draw all of that out. We just had a sketch of where the walls would be. So we didn't even have like a full picture in our head of what the you know the finished house would look like so you can imagine then showing up i bought an acre of land showed up on this acre of land and i had to mark out where the house was going to be in the mud 
And that, that was the first clue of how far in over our head we were, because we're out on this muddy lot and, you know, the two-year-olds stomping through mud puddles and catching lizards and the teenagers and I trying to figure out, like, where do we put the corners of our house? And the kids are like, well, is there some rule? Like, there must be, you know, some way that you're supposed to do this. And I'm like, well, I brought, I've had two wooden broom handles that I cut in half so we had four wooden stakes from old brooms and I said we're just going to pound these in the ground and that's where our house is going to be and the whole time I'm saying this I realize oh this is this is really ridiculous I can hear to myself how ridiculous this sounds and this is the first step and we use string and this sort of archaic kind of how they built the pyramids method of squaring that up without hiring someone to come out and square everything up. So like that was the primitive start. And then from there, it's hauling 1500 concrete blocks to build the foundation. It just, you, you just can't imagine what, what that feels like to stand there and look at all of those blocks and realize what you have started and there's no way out. All of my money is invested in this. We have no way out, no place to live unless we figure out how to do this. That's a, that's very akin to burning the ships when you arrive on shore. There's no going back. And of the the hundreds of details that you just laid out, there, there's a just a gold mine there. The two that jumped out at me is one, you got a loan based off of dining room table drawings. So many people get hung up on perfection that they want it to be so perfect that they'd never pull the trigger anyway. But you were in a spot where this is as good as I can do, and it's going to be what I have. Let's go. And that was good enough to get you moving forward. So that, yeah, it, that... and I think that there's a, there's a, an element of desperation that I brought to the table. Um, that I really had nothing to lose. I had fallen as far as I could possibly fall. I was absolutely determined to, for my kids to have a better life. The kids were set, the oldest two, 17 and 15. So they were about to leave home. And I had this idea, they're never going to want to come back. They don't, you know, have a house that they love. If we just buy some broken down thing and try to fix it up, they're never going to want to come home again. And I want them to have, you know, not just a nice place to come home to, but I want them to have this courage to take out into the world. So I had this feeling of desperation that nothing was going to stop me. We had to do this. And uh, yeah, so taking that to the bank was, a, an, you know, an element of uh, I'm going to make this work. And there's no way a loan officer is going to turn me down. Well, they did, but I just kept going back to banks until I found one who would say yes. That's um, great. The the second the second a good detail. Bet. I ended up being a good bet. <laughs> yeah, right. So that, that's that's a big the big part of it is that passion and desperation and just the look. This is going to work because it has to. Element. It it wasn't an interest. You weren't just going. I think I'll do this thing. It was more of a, here's what I'm already in the middle of, and you can help me move forward, or you could just be just another obstacle I've worked around. Like that's, that's pretty strong negotiation territory right there. And the, the other angle is kind of what you're talking about of the blueprints that you didn't have that fancy three quarter view. You didn't have the artist's rendition of what it is that you're working towards you couldn't picture what the finished product was going to look like. And that is a huge obstacle because most people don't know what they want. They don't know what the house they are working to build should look like or what they want to look like. And if you can't imagine something, it's near impossible to make it real. So the fact that you completed the house is is almost a miracle. Well, now I could see the house in my head. I knew in my head what it was going to look like. It wasn't completely accurate because we had to keep changing things as we went. But I not only could I see it in my head, the kids and I talked about it. Like I said, we were talking about the paint colors. We were talking about the curtains. When the kids were drawing their own bedrooms, we had little 
construction paper cutouts of their beds, of their dressers to scale. So they could see exactly what their bedrooms were gonna look like. So when we were building, and even when we were like in the mud, before we got to a point where there were walls, when we were out here in the mud, if we were gonna take a lunch break, one of the kids, like my 11 year old Jada, she'd go sit like on the sofa in the den to have her lunch break. So we're constantly envisioning this house around us because that's true. If you cannot envision your final goal, there's no way you can hit it. So while we didn't have these artist mock-ups, we each had a picture in our head of this is what the home is gonna look like. It wasn't small, we had to be able to picture it. It's a 3,500 square foot house, um, plus a three car garage, a big shop and a, a two story tree house. It's a big house. So you, you didn't you didn't skimp on the dreaming part. You're like, look, if I'm going to do this thing, I'm going to do it right. It's <laughs> it's not going to be some some one bedroom shack where this is going to be something worth building and building right. Well, and part of the sales pitch to the kids was we can you know, we can borrow enough money from the bank to buy a small broken down house and try to fix it up. You know, we can do that ourselves. That's what we can afford. You guys will have to share some bedrooms. We'll stock up some bunk beds. Or with the same amount of money, we could buy just the supplies, we can build the house, and you can each have your own bedroom. So that was part of the sales, you know, the sales pitch that I gave them. So we had to follow through. They had to each have their own bedroom. We had to do all the bathrooms. And, and I always say that we built a big house because we couldn't figure out how to build a small house because there's an entire big section of the upstairs that was not on the original plans at all. But once I got the whole first floor built and started building the second floor. I couldn't figure out how to do this fancy angled roof knee wall thing that was in my head when I was drawing out the plans. So we just built some more rooms up there. I knew how to do that. <laughs> That's fantastic. There's another angle too, is you had your investors on board first. You had to sell internally mm -hmm. to get the the board in agreement that this is the right direction for the family corporation to move in. And then once you had internal buy in, you could go outside and get the investment dollars on board. But that, and that's always true, right? You have to have your if your whole team doesn't know the goal and just know it, but know their part in it their contribution to it and their benefit from reaching the goal. Like they all have to know that in order to get from point A to point B and to be fully emotionally, mentally invested in it. And, you know, I think with my kids, uh, you know, I look at my youngest now who was two when we built the house is 15. So I look at him as a more normal teenager and, you know, it's hard to get your teenagers to pick up their socks. It's hard to get teenagers to do anything and I had these teenagers out here every single day building a house, but these were teenagers who had no control of their life. They'd seen terrible, terrible things. And this house idea was the first time in their lives when somebody said, hey, you want something better? You can take the physical actions that'll make your life better. Once they really understood that, that if they got up every day and took actual actions, which is so much different than talking about it, writing about it, going to school, this physical work that they could do and every day watching the, the better place that we were going to be, you couldn't stop them from coming out here. That's, that's phenomenal. And that echoes a lot of my own personal background and experience. I grew up a poor kid in North Carolina, up in the mountains in for most of my childhood lived in a trailer and dad was a factory worker and is not easy. No. And we built his wood shop. It's a, uh, it was like 18 by 30, whatever it was from the ground up. And it was janky ground. It's, it's in the mountains. Nothing mm -hmm. is flat. Nothing's level. So when you were talking about using the archaic techniques, <laughs> that was ringing a bell because we used, uh, we used aquarium tubing with water in it as the level to make sure that the floor was going to be level as we were building up the pylons. So it was like a really long, um, it, we used like a line level when we were leveling all of our, uh, our concrete blocks. So you run a string and then, you know, you have a more traditional level with a bubble in it, but you were just making a really long line level. Exactly. Very so the cool. highest, the highest point, 
you you tie the tubing up and then put the water at the right level of where that is and then the tubing can go anywhere on the ground that you want mm -hmm. and then at the opposite lowest corner you put it at a stake right and then wherever that water level is you know it's perfectly down to the atoms level without having to run a string across it it's just this big old snaking tube full of water very that you put blue cool. dye in yeah very I like very it. weird yeah we didn't know that method so we use string i love it i love it so <laughs> part of part of going through something like that is proving to yourself that you can at the point that you've been through that struggle and it's kind of like you've been through war together there's that camaraderie and coming together to, for that shared purpose. At the end of it, sometimes looking back wistfully, you're like, oh, I wish I could go do that again. Was there any of that or was it a, wow, I didn't realize how tough that would be. I never want to touch a hammer ever again. And I'm, I'm never going to. Which, which side did you come down on mostly? I actually had to move a hammer off of my desk to talk to you today. So <laughs> I guess that answers your question. Um, <laughs> we're always building something. There are so many projects in my house at any given time from, I built a desk in the room behind me here over, over quarantine um, bookcases. We're always building something right now. I'm making a bench to go um, a really long bench in my, my bedroom upstairs. We're always making something here. Now, would I ever start from scratch and build another entire house? Um, every now and then, one of my boys, never the girls, will say, when we build my house, I want to do this. And I'm like, oh, geez, really? Did you not learn your lesson? Um, so, you know, it's possible that I will be assisting because turnabout's fair play. I mean, if one of them builds a house, I got to show up. Mom's got to show up and help. They built this house. So, uh, you know, it's, it, there are so many parts of it. Like you said, the camaraderie is just incredible. When we started building the house, obviously it was not instant. It did not start out that way. It would be, you know, it'd be a lovely thing if when you go through trauma and horrible circumstances that you get really close and, and you know how to communicate really well, but the opposite happens. Everybody shuts down. Everybody goes into survival mode. Everybody gets really quiet everybody stays right on the surface of everything. Um, I had great kids, they had straight A's, their bedrooms were clean, but we didn't talk to each other about the important things. Um, it was just that survival mode. We didn't really know each other. So once we got out here in the mud, uh, we had to learn how to communicate really, really fast. And it was that breakdown of all of those barriers that we had built up, uh, you know, just, just being stuck in that survival and that slow breakdown. And I knew that we were getting somewhere when we really started to laugh. And it was everything from just laughing at, you know, ourselves and how ridiculous it was to, you know, us going into the hardware store, laying, for goodness sakes, I ran my own gas lines and we would go into the hardware store and lay gas lines out like down the aisle of the hardware store and try out all of these possible ways. Well, I think when you run gas lines, you probably do this. And people would walk by and be like, what are you crazy people doing? You know, and the two-year-olds playing with the pipes. And, um, and so I would ask them, well, do you know how to run gas lines? I'm happy to have some input over here. You know? <laughs> um, so laughing at the situations and not taking ourselves seriously and, and getting input from everyone everywhere that we could that, you know, we really started understanding each other's personalities and how to communicate and rely on each other. And, you know, within just a few months, going from the foundation up to, you know, building with real wood up out of the mud, which was such an exciting thing, all the way up to, you know, trying to do the rafters and those gas lines, that we got to a point where one of us could just kind of grunt and nod and the other one was like, oh, you need this, this and this, I'm on it. You know, we, we could read each other's minds. Um, which you're very familiar with. So we picked up a, a little bit of your your tips and tricks. That's exactly um, it. When you've been in the same situation with the same people mm -hmm. in the same way for long enough, yep, that contextual awareness just starts right. to click. That's fantastic. Now, there's there's this inkling 
that has been getting louder and louder the older I get, which is the people I like the most have that craftsmanship approach to life. And it's not easy. Part of the, the context is as a magician, you, you know, you can buy that trick deck of cards and it does that one trick super easy, but then it's tough when somebody hands you their deck of cards and goes, okay, do that trick that you're so good at. And suddenly you're no longer magic. The harder way is to learn the sleight of hand that you can pull off that trick with any deck. But anytime that you start owning your own tools to build your own stuff, it's going to be a lot harder than relying on somebody else's pre-built thing. But now we're seeing how difficult that is with, with social media and they're solving the problems of, well, what tools do you have to build relationships and communities online? Mm -hmm. There are no tools. Well, you can build your own server. You can kind of do that computer programming side of things. It's just so darn difficult. But with your background, you're already doing code. So how how much of that do you think in your self-diagnosis would be the percentage of, oh, yeah, this I already had a craftsman kind of approach to work and life already. This was just a different iteration of that same bottom level approach to life. I, I do think that I had that approach. Um, and I, I certainly, I was a computer programmer for 20 years. So, you know, I, I was a senior architect. I developed a lot of software and it's very much that you dive in and you figure it out as you go. Um, you have a general idea of what language you'll probably use and you have a, a pretty vague idea of your outcome depending on how great your client is and you dive in and, and you just make it work. Um, so I, I definitely had that from the professional side, but I also had parents who were very much DIYers, um, pretty much out of necessity. I, I grew up very much like you did. I was very poor. We had to build our own things. We had to make our own things. And they were smaller scale. Uh, but I did have this idea from, you know, from infancy that we just made things. If you needed something, you made it. And my parents had built the house that I grew up in. I was an infant when they built it. So I always had that in my head, you know, if you need a house, you can build one. I did not know because I was an infant that when my parents built our house, they had you know, numerous uncles and, and their parents. So, you know, my grandfathers who all showed up and it was a bit more like a barn raising than it was, you know, a mom and some children. But in my head, I had envisioned my parents doing this. So it felt very possible. And I had, I knew how to use all the tools. And I think that that's how I, I go into every project still. I do not feel like I have to know how to do something in order to start. I don't feel that way in any way at all. A lot of people do. I feel like you have to start doing something before you're going to know how to do it. So when I conceive of an idea, I will grab a post-it note and I could not tell you how many plans I have for things I've built, whether it's a you know, whether it's a, a podcast or a course or an actual piece of furniture in my house, I grab a post-it note, I sketch it out, and then I am out the door on the way to the hardware store with a tape measure in my hand, laying stuff out in the aisle and figuring out how I'm going to put it together. And it's just that, that figure it out mentality that I'm going to start. Because if I wait and I figure out all of those details, something's going to come up that's going to delay it, or I'm going to realize how hard it is, so I'm never going to start it. Or I, I, you know, there's going to be so much more I could research or find a better way and it'll keep getting pushed off, pushed off, pushed off. But if I get out the door and I start it right now, I'm going to finish it. That is fantastic. And that's, that seems to be, if you wanted to put people into two buckets, that would be the approach. The, well, I need to start to learn to finish it versus people who go, oh, I could never lift weights because I'm not strong. Oh, I could never be a runner because I can't run a quarter mile. And it's a fundamental cart before the horse situation. You, you lift weights because you're not strong. You go run because you can't. And that's how you learn to do the thing. It's just so bizarre to me, folks who, who just think, oh, I, I wasn't born as a house builder. Therefore, I could never be a house builder. Just like you, you become a house builder by having done it, not for being born perfectly able to do the thing you've never done before. Like that, 
It's so yeah, weird. And I didn't know when we were building the house, I did not know that there were those two types of people. I thought there was only the type of person like me. And, you know, of course, my parents were that way. My grandparents were that way. My kids were that way. So when, when we were almost finished with the house, and of course, I had a nine-month construction loan, only nine months to do the whole thing while I'm still writing computer code eight hours a day. Um, so with the, it was always a time crunch. We're always behind on everything and worried that the bank's going to take the house because we can't meet this deadline. Well, I had a friend who offered toward the end of the bill to come by and, and help. And warned me at a time, he knew nothing about building houses or any construction. And I'm like, no problem, we can use you. Because neither do I. I don't know anything about building houses either. You know, so he shows up and we had run out of money to buy countertops. So I decided like, we're gonna have to make our own countertops. So we're gonna build these frames and make them out of concrete because we don't have any money. And um, so I show him like, here's what we have to do, but I'm laying tile in another bathroom. So I've got mortar mixed up. I don't have a lot of time to explain to you. Like, we just have to build some frames here and then we're going to pour concrete in them. So, you know, here's the lumber and here's a saw and make some frames. And so I'm laying tile and he comes back a few minutes later and he's like, uh, I, I don't know how to do that. I can't do that. And I was like, you mean you don't know how to do that yet? I mean, after you do it, you'll know how you know, and you'll make a few mistakes along the way. But I just had never conceived of the idea that someone would just say, I don't know how to do that and walk away from it. You know, give me a few minutes and some lumber, I'll figure it out. I'll make a few wrong cuts. It's a good thing we have a lot of scraps around here. Um, I just never had conceived. And that was the moment when I realized and started understanding that other people think differently, and they really feel like they have to know all of this stuff first. Um, but, but yeah, I, I don't. Um, and there are some real downfalls to this kind of a mindset. <laughs> it, it that, that's good to admit. <laughs> that's good to admit that, okay, there, there are some downsides. So what, what to you are the most egregious ones that, that are just glaringly obvious? I think that I could plan a little bit better. I could probably pause and plan a little better. I would have fewer returns for the store. Um, you know, at Lowe's and Home Depot, the people at the return desk know me well, because I will go and buy, you know, and I don't even have like a truck. So I'm filling like the back of my sedan with the seats down and lumber hanging out of the back of it. Um, and, you know, I fill up with everything that I think I need, and then a couple of extras. And then I'll, I'll just, you know, bring it back and start over. So I could plan a little bit more. But again, I have this idea that once I have the idea, I am ready to go. And I couldn't tell you how many times I am calling the kids from the, the lumber yard and saying, can you go measure that wall? Because that's the thing I forgot to do. I forgot to measure the wall I'm building this for before I left the house. You know, and where's the light switch? Tell me exactly where the light switch is, you know? Um, I mean, it's, it's happened dozens and dozens of times, but it gets things done. So I'm not sorry at all. I will keep going to the return desk. I will make more mistakes then maybe I would have with a, a larger plan because while well, somebody else a year from now is still sitting at their desk planning it, I've made three of them. Exactly. And, and I, th I think it's, it's really important to zoom in on the value of having a family and environment in general of being around people who already embodied that pattern so that you just saw that as the default, this is how it's done. And that seems to be a very common monkey see monkey do. This is how human beings operate. That can be awesome. It could also put in patterns that are less than awesome. But as soon as you see it done once, even the folks who would prefer to be more cautious and read the encyclopedia of how to do it, but to be faced with somebody who just goes, yeah, you'll learn, <laughs> get going is, is a really good pattern interrupt to see, oh, I don't have to be scared. I don't have to, to have every last detail nailed down before I move forward. Yeah. Yeah. That's so true. I, and I think that we have to see different mindsets like that and be exposed to them. I mean, my oldest daughter is more of a planner, so she is the one who will slow me down. And she'll be like, whoa, 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 wait, wait. Um, first, figure this out. You know, think about this for one day before you start, before you build a 10 foot tall concrete statue in the front yard. 
maybe you should try to build a three foot tall statue and see how you like the process, you know? And, and so sometimes, you know, she will rein me in a little bit. Um, but I think it's also important <clears throat> to, to say safety and skills. I had used almost every tool that we used to build the house. I had used in some form before we built the house. You know, I was making a bookcase, not a wall, or you know, I was making a bench or something much smaller, but I knew how to cut wood. I knew how to pound in the nails, use a screwdriver, reciprocating saw. I had used all of those things in some capacity before. So I felt like you know, building the house was just doing those things a whole bunch of times you know, the same small skills I already knew. And there are so many places in life where that's true, that if you have, you know, if you look at this massive project, what are the actual skills needed? It's very likely you already have most of the skills needed to do it. You've just done them on a smaller scale and doing them on a larger scale gives you a much bigger payoff. Um, so, you know, that was fascinating to me. There was one tool we used that had to like hit, um, shoot nails into concrete, into the concrete slab that you actually put like a blank bullet in. I don't know what this thing is called. It looks like a telescope. You put a bullet in it and a nail and you hit it with a hammer and then the bullet like drives the, the nail into the concrete. Um, I had never used one of those before, some kind of a driver thing. That scared me to use. It was really loud. But um, other than that, I'd used every single tool. That's awesome. That's awesome. Now, part of my background is I have a degree in painting. I love painting, very visual thinker, communicator. I, I'd like to point at things and let me just draw you, draw you a picture. Mm -hmm. A lot of my artist friends, we talk about business and, and making it as an artist. And a lot of my advice has been, if you want to sell more artwork, be more interesting as a person because most people are, they're not buying your artwork. They're buying the rights to tell the story about buying the artwork. And they're buying their piece of your story so that there's a cocktail party when those were a thing. And somebody goes, comes by and goes, oh, I love that painting. Oh, let me tell you the story about the artist who painted that. That's really what they're buying. So if you want to sell more, be more interesting. Yeah, that is so true. And then that's for every, not just art, but of course, every single, you know, type of sales. Being an interesting person, um, I think that we like to be around interesting people, but sometimes we forget to be that person. Right. And is, is that kind of how you made the transition from being focused on providing a place for your family to live? And now being a professional speaker and person who talks about the thing you did, right? So always, is it is it just that the project was so, so inspiring that people just kept asking you, hey, would you would you come talk about the thing? And then you're like, I'm doing this enough. I better be getting paid for this. And then that became your speaking gig. Like how how did you transition out of doing the old way into talking about the things you did? You know, I, I wish that the story were different. I wish that it were like so strategic and I could say, well, follow these steps and this is how it works. But but yeah, it was very much the accidental route. Um, like I said, I was a computer programmer and I was a writer. So I wrote books. You couldn't get like more behind the keyboard and off the stage than me. Um, I had done some little magic shows with my kids when they were young. So I had been on some really small, like elementary school stages, but I was never intending to be a professional speaker ever. So that was a massive step for me. Um, I was a fiction writer. So I wrote fiction books and I had a, a, a major New York agent approach me and say, you know, one of my authors told me that you built a house. I want you to write that book. And um, I said no for a really long time. And then I spent six years trying to write it or writing it multiple times. And before I figured out how to write it, how to tell the story and how to tell the really hard parts of the story, because I, I realized pretty early, I couldn't just, it couldn't just be a you know, story about a mom and kids building a house. Like I had to tell why. Um, and the why is hard. And to be that vulnerable and real about the worst mistakes you've ever made in your life and how they hurt your kids is a hard book to write. Uh, I did that 
and it sold at, you know, big New York City auction with a whole bunch of publishers involved. Uh, you know, great, I got a great advance, six figure advance on the book. And the publisher Macmillan, uh, St. Martin's had a speakers bureau and they asked me if I would be willing to, you know, share the story on a stage. And I thought, well, I can, I can talk about that. And um, they called me, you know, within a couple of weeks and were like, yeah, we booked you for your first thing. And then I learned that speaking could be a career. I never knew until then, until I, and, and I learned a lot. I did it really wrong the first time and uh, I've, I've learned a lot. So, and, and it was, it's such an obvious, an obvious match for corporate. I think, uh, you know, there are these men and women both have this sort of appeal to a hands-on story and a, a building thing story. And of course, then there's home and children, but more importantly, gosh, this is a story about teamwork, you know, and, and the way that we came together to build this house and the, the types of leadership that we used, which was actually a, a pretty cool type of leadership because it was this sort of, you know, it, it wasn't this, um, traditional style of leadership that I had grown up with, where you tell everybody what to do. It was very much this command central where I just told them the mission and they had to figure out how to get there. They had the skills, they knew the parameters we were working with and they had to figure out how to get there. Um, and, and, and I was working within that parameter as well with kind of the, the loan officers as well as the city inspectors coming by um, to, to keep me on that path. So, you know, it, it ended up having uniquely these really neat ways to tie it into to corporate talks and as well as to, you know, motivational speaking. So it was very unexpected. I did not expect to be where I am. Right. And that, that's the same process in just a different dimension. You, you had to do the thing and you figured it out in the middle of it. And again just to go back to the two different ways of seeing the world there it's just so common to hear people go well when somebody gives me a chance then i'll be successful i just need somebody to believe in me first i i need that advance then i'll write the book then i'll go do the thing to write the book about when it's completely backwards you've got to go do the weird stuff You've got to go live your life, go be interesting for a while, then you've got something to talk about, and then you can you can leverage that. So for the the corporate side of things, was that part of the the coding background that you had already being in the corporate world? And then after after it's built and you've been asked to write the book, you go, oh we were doing leadership stuff because most folks I would think are just saying, well, I was just talking to my kids. They wouldn't put it in. This was leadership development opportunities, right? So how were you able to identify those core benefits and principles that you were exploring in the building process and then identify the abstract principles that you could then apply within a business context? I think it's mostly because I'm really weird. Um, you know, I spent six years writing a, writing a book about my life and I mean, there are 20 versions of it. So when you dissect every element of your childhood, your life, your family, the relationships on the construction site, and you're making character arcs for the growth of each child, and then you're trying to draw ties between you and your children and how all of this happened. I started to realize like, I didn't do any of this in the normal ways that I learned how to lead my family, not the way my parents led a family, not the way that we did projects as kids, as far as the interaction between me and my kids. So I started reading leadership books to understand why this worked because I kept coming to the conclusion that this should have not worked. Like it didn't follow any of the parameters that I understood. So it should have not worked, but it did. So why did it? Um, so I just kept trying to, and I came across some crazy Wikipedia trail one day. And this was like two years after I first started trying to figure it out about the Prussian army and this command style leadership. And, you know, it turns out our army uses that now and the forestry service uses the command style leadership. And I think Google, you know, a lot of corporations now use it. 
So I started looking at it and I was like, my goodness, that's exactly what we did. That's exactly, and that's why it worked. It is a successful leadership strategy. And, you know, it's not the micromanaging, um, you know, that I had seen even in the corporate world where I had worked as, as a programmer and a, an analyst that, you know, it was such a foreign thing, but it worked and it's more of an ancient and successful way of leading than, you know, what we think of now as the traditional kind. So yeah, that was a very deliberate search. And it wasn't a search at that time for speaking because I was not speaking. It was just, I wanted to understand why it was successful. Um, because when you look at you know, the time frame that we had, the ages of the kids, I mean, the only man on the construction site was my 15 year old son. I'm a 110 pound computer programmer. You know, when you look at all of this, it just does not add up to being a, a good bet, you know? <laughs> um, so I had to understand every element of it to better understand myself and to be able to communicate it well in, in a book. And, you know, then of course, eventually after I finished the book that translated well to a stage and workshops and et cetera. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that, that was kind of what happened with me and being a performer specializing in hijacking the psychology of how human beings interact with reality. That's really what's going on. So then seeing all these business gurus talking about, I understand the psychology of this and I understand the psychology of that. I was like, I don't, I don't think you do. Like, <laughs> I've got a, a lot of, of books talking about human psychology and why these tricks work. And then started seeing the parallels because I, I never came up through corporate America. Like that, the most normal job I've, I've had is being a sales guy, just talking shop and then going, well, you want to do this or not? Let's go. Right. <laughs> that's, that's pretty much it. So yeah, the, realizing the value of your personal experience and then being able to apply that within a business context is really valuable. It, it's just phenomenal. Well, and, and like you, I, there's, it's such a great thing to have a non-corporate story to tell you know, whether it's an, an athlete or for you with, with magic and sleight of hand and understanding our, our perceptions of reality, that's such a great way to communicate in a way that people will remember. Um, and the same thing with showing, you know, a two-year-old in the mud on a construction site, or, you know, people remember that. And there's a different way that you can draw those lines and, and connect everything um, that it fits. It fits. Yeah. Uh, a big part of why I transitioned or at least expanded my focus beyond the stage of performing into the training and speaking dimension was doing the show and then talking to people in the autograph line about, yeah, here's here's my path. I, I have a degree in painting and, and I travel the world entertaining people. Yeah, sure. And then people going, man, I can't even imagine doing that for a living. And then talking to them for 10 minutes, then three years later, getting an email saying, hey, I don't I don't know if you remember me, but we spoke for 15 minutes in Spokane, Washington. So it changed my life. Here's what I did. It's awesome. Thank you so much. I just wanted to let you know that was the first glimpse of, oh, this this might be worth specifically cultivating and might be something I'm honor bound to spend my energy doing beyond the chuckles. So then realizing what kind of change you can affect, mm -hmm. you start to get real squirrely about being intentional about that and trying not to unintentionally make it go the opposite way. So for you, what was it that started that process, right? Like I can, I can only imagine the amount of feedback that you get from people who here I was, I heard your story here I am now. And those are two very different places to be and to wind up. So what, what kind of feedback are you getting from your work? Yeah. It, it feels like a huge responsibility, doesn't it? You know, um, it, to, to share your story and hope that the impact goes in the right direction because yeah, it, it is big. Um, you know, I didn't expect that when I first started the first couple of times I spoke and you have the, the long lines of people to sign a book and that sort of just thing. being nice. 
that's that's what my brain told me right was right. these people are just being nice <laughs> Yes. It's just they they know that's what they should be doing because that's what they feel like they should be doing. Yeah. So I had to work through a lot of that, too. <laughs> yeah. But what I didn't expect was exactly what you're saying. These people stand in line and then it's their turn and they drop their story in your lap. They're like, you know, I'm, I'm 30 years old. I've got a two year old child. My wife just left with the child. I don't think I'll ever see him again. They're living with my best friend. And then they wait for you to fix it. And you've got, you know, 75 people behind them waiting for their turn. And you you try to figure out like, how can I, I call it flash counseling. How can I flash counsel through this? And then the next person comes and they're like, you know, uh, my mom just died and, and, and then they drop that. Um, or I wanna build a house too, where do I start? Um, I, you know, just person after person after person. And you kind of, the first few times, especially I thought I've been hit by a bus. You know, I don't, I don't know what happened. I left feeling just exhausted and I felt so insecure of, you know, am I offering the right advice? What am I doing? Um, I'm not qualified to do this. You know, I wasn't expecting all of it, but then I started getting the feedback and, you know, it, and like you said, like years later, even getting the feedback. And I've had a couple of people, I, almost every time I speak, I see a mom on the phone. There's a lady on a phone, four people back in the line, and she keeps looking at me and she's still got the phone up. And when she steps up to me, she hands me the phone. And I know right away, it's her daughter, it's her sister, it's her best friend who's in a domestic violence situation and it's life or death. And I have that moment with all these people looking at me, waiting to have their book signed to try to help. And I had a lady, um, someplace in Kentucky one time come up to me. She paid for a VIP ticket to an event to come and have the, the dinner the night before. And she said, do you remember a lady handing you a phone in Colorado? And I was like, well, of course I do. You know, like that only happened once. And, um, and she said, that was me. And that was my mom. And here's what you'd said. And here's how that changed my life and where my kids and I are today. And, you know, my story had 2 billion hits in the first year around the world. Um, every country, every language. I had a lady from Russia that messaged me today on Instagram. My book is also in Russian, who told me about her children. And she's in a terrible situation. And she's trying to get to a better spot. Um, uh, you know, there's a man who just became a ninja. He became a ninja because I told him he could do whatever he wanted to do. Um, you know, so it's. The, the most amazing things that come out of it. Oh, there's a lady in like, oh goodness, I'm going to get it wrong. There's a lady in another country that I just forgot which country. She decided to build a studio in her backyard. Her and her, her husband built a yoga studio. She started a yoga studio business and she's written a book after hearing my story. How can you not do it? That is phenomenal. That is fantastic. Yeah. That that's awesome. So how, <laughs> yeah, part, part of how I hear that is from doing the readings side of my life, because, uh, just, I love tarot cards. I love using playing cards as tarot cards. All it is really, all it is for me is a system of building context for the person to work through themselves. That's all it is. So the only thing that they see in the cards is what they're bringing to the table. So it's it's kind of like in Star Wars. It's like the 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 only force you bring in there is the fort, right? So so having that moment of responsibility of saying, okay, here's my problem, fix it that's man that's brutal so i i've always tried to to frame it in terms of listen this can't tell you anything about somebody else it can't tell you the future it can't give you advice all it can do is give you an outside dimension on your current mm -hmm. confusion to see it in a way to build a different story than the only story you have to tell yourself and when you can tell yourself a new story, suddenly there can be a new ending. And then that frees them up from the, the constraint of, well, here's the only thing my life is. 
because of these reasons. It's like, that's a very believable and story. they're stuck in a loop, right? They're stuck right. in a loop. They're stuck in a loop. So it, it's, I love that. That's fascinating. It sounds like what you're doing is kind of giving them a framework or an outline and then, and just the most, the most basic set of that outline and they're filling in all of the details. And if you're giving them a framework that has that sort of, you know, once upon a time, beginning, middle and end, then it's going to pull them out of that loop and down that framework. That's fascinating. Exactly. I never thought of, I don't know anything at all about tarot readings, except I was writing a book about voodoo for a while when I learned a little, I have a set here somewhere because I bought them so I could look at them, but you're going to have to teach me that. Um, I love that. I love that, that presentation. Um, fascinating. Yeah. I want to find a way to use that. Yeah. And, and a big part of it is a detail about your story is you had a million reasons not to do the thing. Every single one of them, totally legitimate, completely logical. And anybody else would have said, that's the right decision to make. And you, you said it way earlier, you, you were doing it for your kids. You, you had such a clear enough reason to do it. You only need that one reason to go for it to outweigh the thousands of reasons to not do something right. and to use those reasons not to do something to undermine the one reason to do it to me is a travesty. I agree. And, and, you know, I think that we listen to the noise outside and the expectations outside and try to fit in the box of what everybody else thinks we should do. And I was uniquely positioned because as a, a, a victim of this domestic violence and because we had you know, somebody stalking us and we were afraid for our lives for over a decade, that we were very isolated. Now that there are a lot of negatives to that. There are more negatives than positives to the level of isolation that we had endured, but the positive side, and there always is one, is that I wasn't listening to any of that noise. I was looking at, here's the situation I'm in. And here is all of the stuff that my kids need. You know, we need a house, we need confidence. We need, you know, th this whole long list of things that we needed. And then I made a list without any outside input of what I thought could be done to remedy that situation. And so there was nobody there to tell me, well, you can't do that. You shouldn't do that. And when I first, so I decided to do it and I started doing it. I applied for the loan. We drew the house plans. And then I called my dad in Wisconsin. I'm by Little Rock, Arkansas. And my dad, I called my dad in Wisconsin and he's like, what are you thinking? You can't build a house. And I was stunned. I was stunned because in my mind, anybody who was facing exactly what I was facing and looked at here's what we need and here's where we are, would have come to the exact same solution. Like that would have been exactly what anybody would do. And I 100% thought that when we started. By the time we finished, I realized it was a little bit out there and probably not the conclusion everybody would have come to. But I 100% believed that when we started. Well, of course, this is what we do. This is what anybody would do in this situation right here. It's the most obvious and only solution. I so, love that. Know, and it's important to be around people like you who just go, yeah, of course. Right. <laughs> but, and that's so, the not taking yourself too seriously. Mm hmm. Yep. It's not worrying so, about other people. And, you know, I don't care if I look a little silly at the hardware store or out here trying to, you know, build a house wrong several times before I do it right. I don't yep. care. You know what? That's part of the fun. That's part of the journey. You know? If yeah. If we can't laugh at ourselves with ourselves and you know then gosh yep. life it, wouldn't be any fun at all but I, i'm i'm really really particular about who i tell about things that aren't done yet because of yes. that moment of you can't build a house you right. can't blah 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 and that is such mm -hmm. a precious little thing that it's really easy to crush it. So the only people that I have are people when I say to maybe two or three people to say, oh, I'm, I'm going to write this book. And my friends just go, okay, tell me when it's done. Like that, it is just so nonchalant. 
and blase that of course you're going to do the thing you said you're going to do because we're people who do what we say we're going to do and are capable of making it happen there wouldn't even be a second thought that you couldn't do it so it's just really cool to make sure you insulate yourself with can do awesome people like that that's so true yeah that's that's actually a big part of the the course that i have i have a build something course and that's a big part of it that you have to you have to be there's naysayers out there and there are people for good intentioned reasons who will try to stop you it's not all jealousy you know sure there's some of that but people have good intentions and they're trying to protect you from yourself or you know whatever they whatever they throw out there but um you know, yeah, you do have to, like you said, they're very, very precious. And writing is one of the biggest things. When I write a book, that's something you don't tell people because people can just tear it apart and it'll never get off the ground. Um, but yeah, that, that's really, really important. I tell my kids, but then I have other friends who will call me and they're like, what are you working on? And I stop and I think, and I'm like, oh, a project, you know, <laughs> so all you need to know, I'm not juggling with fire right now or anything. I'm just a project, you know? <laughs> exactly exactly the the part of myself that does that self-critiquing i call him frank and <laughs> I love that. in criticizing the new thing is the best way frank knows how to protect me he just doesn't want me to get hurt doesn't want me to be disappointed doesn't want me to to experience the ruin of a dream so you know what jonathan how about you just don't do that it's easier like thank you frank You've been heard. I appreciate you. Get back in your room. <laughs> I must have a Frank that I just outrun. I'm like already at the <laughs> hardware store and they cannot catch up with me or wherever. I love I'm that. Already... Yeah, that I just is... outrun them. <laughs> you know, so... not long ago when I was over, over COVID, I took all of my books out of my bookshelves and, and papers and files and went through them. And I found some of the list of when we started building the house. And I showed them to a couple of people and they're like, oh my gosh, you should like share these. I'm like, are you kidding? If anybody could see the drawings, I mean, it's like a third grader drawing, like I, if I built a house someday, it'd look like this, you know, <laughs> it, that's what the drawings looked like. And that is not before we built the house. That's like, we're halfway through and I'm trying to figure out our kitchen, you know, where the cabinets are going to be laid out or, or, you know, various things through the house. And I'm like, that was like some really serious and important stuff I was drawing there. And, um, yeah, people would have stopped me. Yeah, and and that's another another huge detail is you don't have to render it perfectly in a dimension that isn't what your focus is. It doesn't have to be drawn perfectly in order for you to build functional cabinets. There those are two completely separate domains. Right. The important one is the physical one where you're manifesting reality through your time and energy. Like that's kind of awesome. The rough drawings, they, they can be a sketch. Good enough to get going is good enough. And I'm capable of drawing the, you know, the more precise blueprint. And sometimes I do, but it's usually after I've purchased most of the things and I'm just trying to figure out the details. But to get started, I don't need any of that. I just need the rough stuff. And partially because I don't know everything they're going to have at the at the lumber yard, or I don't know what I already have out in my shop, and I need to go out there and, and lay it all out. And I'm using all building stuff here, but you know, and this this goes towards any project that I do, whether like I said, I'm building a podcast or whatever it is, I do not have to know everything about the details of the equipment that I'm going to need in order to start writing it, in order to start doing a rough recording on my phone, um, you know, to just try to get it off the ground with that post-it note sketch, um, then fill in the details. Yeah, uh, you you mentioned your course. I want to be a lot more intentional about saying, OK, please tell people what it is that you're building to help them imagine their dream house project, whatever that shapes up to be. So what what are some of the things that you're spending your time creating to help other people create their time? Well, I have the podcast coming out in just a couple of weeks, the 22nd of February. So that's, that'll be fun. 
Um, I think it's a lot of work right now. I'm in that stage of, oh my goodness, what was I thinking? This is a whole lot of work, but I love it. Um, and it is all about going in and starting and finishing things. It's all about tackling projects. There's a lot of psychology in it because I'm constantly reading and learning. And I was a psychology major for quite a while too. Um, and then I have the course, I have a build something course that is also about starting and finishing a big project. And it's all psychology based. And it is this idea that I have so many people that come to me and just say, here's this thing I wanna do, but I'm stuck. I don't know how to get started. And anytime I do get started, I lose my motivation. I get buried, I get overwhelmed. So it's a course that takes you through, here's how to start and finish a really big project. Um, and I had a lot of fun creating it. That was another big COVID creation, you know, quarantined here for, for a year. I did a lot of projects and that was so much fun. Um, hours of video and, and a, a little workbook with it and stuff. So yeah, I, I'm really excited about that. I'm already getting feedback now that, that just launched the beginning of the year. So I'm already getting feedback from people who are going through that and, and things that they're starting and doing. And I've got some free opt-ins on my, on my website too, which is just carabrookins.com um, for people who are just stuck and trying to figure out that way to get unstuck. I have an unstuck email challenge and I have a power day um, free opt-in too. So um, lots, of, lots of fun stuff out there I've put together to try to get people up and moving. I, I believe in action. I believe in physical action even if your project seems um, pretty cerebral. I believe you have to have lots of different ways throughout your project that you're taking physical action so that your body can feel the progress. Amen to that. We, I didn't even tell you about my Kung Fu practice. And oh my goodness. to me, that is the, the fundamental substrate to work out all the abstract stuff. You can work it out at a physical level to prove to yourself the strategy will work at a more abstract level. So yeah, that's that's nice to, to hear you cool. talking about that. Oh, I love that. Yeah, I've only, I've taken like a couple of self defense kind of classes, um, but yeah, that's one thing I've always been someday. Uh, let me add that to my list. I don't have enough hobbies <laughs> really. I need more. I love it. I love it. So in in addition to where people can kind of engage with your work, where do you hang out online? Where, where should people find you and follow? Primarily Instagram. And I am starting a TikTok channel too. I do not know if you want to go there. I've got, I'm just starting that. So it'll be Instagram and, and TikTok, but you can get to all of those from, from my website. Outstanding. I'll, I'll for sure put that in the show notes as, as per standard operating procedure. <laughs> okay, thanks. And uh, is, as we're, Coming up on the, the end of our time together, is there anything else that uh, you for sure wanted to, to mention or talk about that I didn't touch on? I think we have covered it. I think we have started everybody on like 27 new hobbies just in one show. We've got like tarot reading, magic and mentalism. We've got some type, was it, did you say Taekwondo? Uh, my, my flavor is, is Wing Chun Kung Fu. Okay, okay, Kung Fu, I mean, people are going to be, people are going to be calling us to complain. Um, <laughs> we've got too many people out there doing too many things. I love it. That that's what I tell people. I, I just go, look, I'm alive this once that I know of. Right. I have this one fire called my life and I'm going to put as many irons in there as I can yeah. for me to, to experience what there is of this ride. So yeah, it's yeah, like so many people are yeah. waiting. They're waiting for a moment. There's going to be a thing that happens. My 15 year old the other day, we're, we're out and I said something, you know, like now that you're a grown up this and he's like, I'm not a grown up. And I was like, what do you mean? I, I consider my kids grown ups at 13. They're like on their own. <laughs> they have to do their own laundry. They have to cook. They're like, I'm here to guide you after that. At 13, you're, you're pretty much there. And um, I said, Roman, there is nothing that just happens. There's no one day that you just like arrive. It's not like a thing. And that's every part of your life. Um, you, if you're just waiting for that thing, like to, to cross some magic line in the sand and then things are gonna be better, or you're gonna be ready. Um, it's, it's just not how it works. Um, you just do it. If you wait until you're ready, you're too late. Too late. <laughs> that's for sure. Well, well, we'll call that a stuck landing if there ever was one. <laughs> so thank you so much for making the time to 
to share your story and, and to talk shop with me. I, I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. You made it a lot of fun. Beautiful. And in uh, my, my turnaround is, is pretty quick. Um, I, I try to get it out as quickly as I can. So in the next couple of weeks, yours you should be live so i'll get okay, you great. the link to the site and all that jazz try and make it super easy to to share for you Excellent. and yes yeah, there anything else i can't think of it if i've got it but i want to uh, know more yeah. about your painting and stuff so we're gonna have to set up a separate call sometime and i need to hear more about you're gonna get me involved in some i've, I've done some painting i want to do some more so we're gonna it's um, it's gonna a at some point deal yeah. seriously take me up on that because yeah. i i have a lot of weird rabbit holes because i i have a degree in studio painting started with acrylics and then i started painting on an ipad and then turned those ipad paintings that are hand painted it's not like i press the button and it does a filter it's like right. hand painted not like and a then, coloring book but right right and then turned those into crypto prints on the Ethereum blockchain that I sell as genuinely, provably, demonstrably scarce pieces of art that have their providence built into their DNA as a as an entity, which is just super cool. And then I exhibit them in where, VR. Where can I find these? Uh, you exhibit them in VR? Yeah. So we can so, go to a gallery? We've got like an Oculus Rift, we can go exactly and it works in your browser too okay yeah okay yeah but... you have to send me some links to this i have to see this deal i did i've done some small paintings and we i've got one i'll send you a picture of this one that i have um that i it was a really funny project because i had just spoke in um spain in madrid at a big conference for google and youtube and I spent like nine days there just all by myself and wandered all over Madrid and I went to all the museums and I saw this, you know, really cool Renoir painting that I liked and then came back and we had a big Japanese TV show that was coming to the house to film. And I had a wall in my house I didn't like in the dining room and I'm like, I got to do something to that wall before this Japanese crew shows up in two weeks. And so I like take everything off the wall and I decide I'm going to build a massive like fireplace on the wall, like a faux fireplace, because the idiot who designed the house had no idea where to put the <laughs> HVAC vent and put it like right in the middle of the dining room wall. So I'll make it look like it's intentional and build a fireplace around it and that sort of thing. So I built the fireplace out of a piece of an old piano and some scrap lumber. And it's just little fireplace mantle and then I needed art to go over it and I was like well I really like that Renoir that I saw in Spain I'll just paint that you know so I did I got a sea sponge and a bunch of paint and I painted this little painting I put my cat in it though I've got a Cornish <laughs> Rex cat so my cat is also in the painting um but and that after I did that I was like I really want to get into painting but I have no idea what I'm doing I mean I literally just bought a bunch of paints and started putting them on canvas I've done some acrylic and some watercolor and just played around with stuff, but yeah, someday I'm going to learn more of that and have more time to do it. Yeah. That's, that's the trick, right? Yep. yep. <laughs> and I've got a big awesome. easel that sit, stays in my den behind me all the time. Um, I've got a big project desk that I built in there. And then I've got an easel that stays in there all the time. Cause I, I declare things like that. Like I, I want a physical representation of the goal that I have. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to forget it. Mm -hmm. And there's a yep. big sign, big concrete sign in front of my house that says Inkwell Manor, because I'm going to write books. This is the Inkwell that all my books are going to spring from. So I'm going to write more books. So you can't run away from that kind of stuff. I love that. Everybody that's, who comes in your house is like, oh, you paint? Yes, is the answer. Exactly. Like, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, I'll I'll send you I'll send you links to some of the the crypto prints and and then the VR gallery that that I built. <laughs> Very cool. So so weird, so yeah, weird. Well. I thought I thought you were a mind reader. I'm like, <laughs> if I could be a mind reader, <laughs> I could be other things too. Like they, they, they right, not, right. Not you exclusive. could be all the things actually, and tarot reading too. Ah, oh, mm -hmm. very cool. Yeah, I'll uh let me make a note to myself. Here, where's my mission control? There it is. And my catch all notes. There we go. Do 
send car domancy book in the VR gallery link. That's why I don't take notes during the, the, the chat because my keyboard is so loud. Yeah, I know. I always have like a pen and a notebook and I like don't look down at it and write stuff on it, but then it's really hard to decipher later. <laughs> that, that's a good strategy to make sure you don't take notes that are too careful. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Awesome. All right. Well, I've got that as my, my homework. I'm going to go feed the cat, get ready for the okay. evening. And yeah, thank you for being you. I'm so <laughs> thankful that Allison introduced us. Um, she's freaking amazing. So. Yep. Yep. Awesome. All right. Well, okay. have a good evening and yeah, looking forward to continuing the conversation. Okay. And let me know when and where to share. I'll share it everywhere. Cool. Thank you very much. Thanks. All right. Have a good night. Thanks. You too. Bye. Bye.